This episode is proudly sponsored by The Helix, a new innovation district located in New Brunswick, New Jersey, the heart of the Northeast Corridor. The Helix provides a critical ecosystem for innovation by offering a range of physical environments, a vibrant community of leading innovators, and a strategic central location on the Northeast Corridor. The Helix will uniquely mix workspaces, classrooms, laboratories, venues, and collaborative environments creating a dynamic community and setting for innovative minds. Universities, startups, Fortune 500 companies, entrepreneurs, researchers, and many others will all call the Helix home. Thus far, the Helix has assembled a community of innovative private and public organizations, such as Rutgers Health, the New Jersey Innovation Hub, RWJ Barnabas Health, Hackensack Meridian Health, universities from Ireland and Israel, and others. The Helix is where ideas will come to life. To learn more, visit helixnj.com. Ryan Reynolds here for, I guess, my 100th Mint commercial. No, 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 don't, no, don't, no. I mean, honestly, when I started this, I thought I'd only have to do like four of these. I mean, it's unlimited premium wireless for $15 a month. How are there still people paying two or three times that much? I'm sorry, I shouldn't be victim blaming here. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash save whenever you're ready. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See details. From NJ.com and the Star Ledger, welcome to the Rutgers Rant, your one-stop podcast for the Scarlet Knights. With your hosts, Steve Politi and Rutgers insiders, Brian Fonseca and Pat Lenny. Let's start shopping. All right, welcome back to the Rutgers Rant. I'm Pat Lanny, guest hosting today while Steve Politi is in Paris. I'm here with Brian Fonseca, of course, and we're camping. I've never been camping in my life, but I've been football camping a couple years now, so I know I'm looking forward to it. There's a lot of excitement around this Rutgers team. We're a month away from the first game, which kind of seems crazy, but things happen fast and uh, a lot of expectations. But let's start with just... We're going to camp. What are you most excited for, Brian? Feels like the first day of school, and it's felt like it's dragged on and dragged on this offseason, and now we're here. You're right, and we're a month away, and kickoff against Howard is going to be here before we know it, and that's what I'll see what I'm most excited about, which is how Ethan Calic Manis will look for Rutgers. That's been the biggest question all offseason, and as much as we saw in the spring, as much as we may see in training camp, I'm just really excited to see Ethan Calic Manis operate the offense, how he looks, and just what the you know projection of the Rutgers offense looks, because I think that's really the biggest question mark. The defense is pretty set. We kind of know what to expect. The offense is, we'll, we'll, we'll see. We know, like you said, everything looks good on defense. A lot of returning players there. Up to seven guys on offense, depending on how things shake out. Cali Manis obviously being the, the big X factor in this season, no question. I think the thing I'm looking forward to from camp the most uh, and and Greg Shiano hinted at this at, at Media Day. I thought it was a really fascinating quote. He was kind of just saying that Kirk Shiraka implemented the offense last year, year one. Obviously, a very run-heavy, one-dimensional kind of offense because of the lack of passing game. But year two is about the mastery of it. And how does this offense take off? If quarterback plays better, it could it could really take off. And I'm really excited to see in these practices – how different the offense looks, what's the same, what's different. Obviously, it doesn't seem like things are going to change drastically. That'd be kind of insane. We know this is a, a very systematic approach from Shiraka, and you, why Why would you change when you have this great running back committee too, uh, not just Manungai. So, like I said, I, I'm curious just to see this offense in action for the first time uh, since spring, and and we'll, we'll see uh, see what it actually looks like. That's what it's all about. Yeah, and, and it's interesting because a lot of these guys that are coming back, they're in their second year under Shiraka. Uh Kelly Kmanis is technically also in his second year under Shiraka, just with a year gap uh, in, in Minnesota. I'm wondering if he picks things up where he left them off. I have to think, like you said, you have Kyle Benungai. You're probably going to ride him in the running game a lot. I think the offense, if I had to guess, is still going to be a lot of run the ball, take care of the ball, and... Kelly Manis is tasked to do the thing that Gavin Wimsett couldn't do, which is complete the simple passes, move the chain, and just don't stall the offense. In again, with easy passes, simple throws, and every once in a while, you know, make the big play. Uh, yeah, just just going to be really interesting. I don't know how much we will see of where, how the offense looks in training camp, but any glimpse we get, I think, will be pretty exciting. Absolutely. You talked about the receivers, and I thought this was crazy. 
Scarlet Knights have 17 wide receivers listed on their spring roster, uh, which is just so many to me. And it, I, if you really break it down, you go guy by guy, it's a room that has 10 guys that are really competing for this job in my eye. And how that all shakes out, who emerges as the number one receiver is going to be a really fascinating storyline in, in training camp. Obviously, there's there are high expectations for Dimir Miller coming in out of Monmouth after what he's what he's done there, uh, his past success, his skills and attributes. So Greg talked about him at, performing at a high level in, in the spring. And I think obviously expectations are high for him. So but that's definitely one of those position battles uh, that I'll be focusing on. What are the other ones for you, Brian? Yeah, Greg Schiano mentioned offensive line. He said one to two spots. And I think we can kind of figure out that those are on the right side of the line. Left side is kind of, you know, solidified with Holland Pierce, Brian Felter, and Gus Solinskis at center. Uh, I think Shedrick Rhodes, uh, right tackle they got out of Ohio in the transfer portal in the summer is a clear indication that they want more out of that position. And at the worst, he will compete with Tyler Needham and Reggie Sutton for the starting spot at right tackle. But I think in an ideal world, when you bring in a guy from the transfer portal, he's coming in as a plug and play and will start at right tackle. And then right guard is interesting, right? Curtis Dunlap graduates. You have real vacancy there. I think Kobe Asamoah is the guy that's been in the program long, will have a chance, or I, I think will have the upper hand there. But I think that will be a legitimate competition with some other young guys you know Dante Chin uh, is one name that comes to mind but plenty of other young guys that have been in the program uh, that can emerge and win the spot I don't think last year at this time we were thinking that Brian Felter was going to become the starting left guard I don't think halfway through the season we'd think that and obviously he emerged and solidified that spot so uh, that's one side I'm really looking at and then the other one that Greg Shaw mentioned was tight end which I was interested in uh, he did note that Kenny Fletcher is kind of ahead of the race there convert converted defensive end uh, who looked good in the spring uh, but you mentioned the older guys are kind of nipping at his heels there, Mike Higgins, Victor Kanapka. Those are guys that are uh, competing and have a chance. So uh, I don't know. I, I don't really have a sense of how that one will land. I think it's kind of a sneaky underrated position that they didn't use much last year, but I think you've got to have at least some competent blocking and hopefully this year, some semblance, semblance of an impact on the passing game. I'll tell you what, Fletcher, Mike Higgins, Kanopka, even all super athletic guys that I, I think are are undervalued, underappreciated, and and kind of like a maybe a hidden gem of this offense. So I, I hope that Rutgers can get the tight end game involved. It's been not that Johnny Langan wasn't involved. I thought he brought a lot to the offense. So much versatility, obviously, opened up exponential options uh, from his versatility standpoint. But I think from an athletic standpoint, these are guys that can really block well. They can go out, catch the ball at their highest point. So. I, I think that's a, a really good one. Um, and and back to the offensive line, when we talk about that right side, you mentioned the names. I, I'm kind of looking at it as four guys for two spots, right? Needham and Sutton played tackle at, last year. Kobe Asamoa was at guard at times. And Shedrick Rhodes, like you said, coming in, started all 13 games for Ohio last year, mostly at right tackle, but can also play guard. So I think those are the those are the four guys. Uh, that are that are there and based on how that offensive line improved last year I, it's huge it's huge and, and definitely a key to this season so definitely something to keep an eye on i think pat flaherty has earned the right to have some trust from people that they will figure it out and they will play at a competent level and i think that'll be a key part for uh, next season and really quick i want to go back to wide receiver uh you mentioned a lot of the names i think the wide receiver room is in the best position it's been under shiano and maybe even in the entirety of the ash era where a lot of the times they had one guy who you can depend on and a bunch of guys you hope to get something out of uh last year that guy was christian dremel he's obviously back i think dimir miller rex shiano seemed really high on him i think he has to be the x factor the wide receiver one for this offense to take the next step and you got a bunch of young guys in the back that even if one or two of them kind of live up to expectations, you're in a really good spot. Benjamin Black's got a ton of buzz this offseason. KJ Duff got a ton of buzz this offseason as true freshman. And then Ian Strong is a guy who showed glimpses last year. He could take the next step. Fama Ture, a guy who looks the part physically, was banged up a little bit last year. Can he take the next step? So I think that might be the most fascinating position. Uh, and I think, again, Rutgers could feel good about where it stands, but you got to hope you know a few of those guys really rise to the top and help the position take the next step that is expected. I think it's it's one of those chicken or egg situations. Catch twenty two, right? Like was was Rutgers receive were Rutgers receivers playing at a high level and the passing like the, the ball wasn't getting there, or 
were the receivers not getting open? I, you know, it's, it's such a combination of both and hard to really say, but I think you're hundred percent right. This is, this is a much improved receiver room with veteran experience at the top. Nassim Brantley is another guy that could make a big splash. Uh, he's, he's done it at a, you know, at the FCS level. So a lot of potential and, and it's just fascinating. Like I said, 10 guys, I think are like legitimate playing time guys, which is great from a depth perspective. To jump off on that, to your point, uh, I think quarterback is, again, the position that we're keeping a close eye on. I asked Greg Schiano if he feels the position is in a better spot today than it was a year ago, and he said it better be and that he believes it is. I'll ask you the same question. Do you think Rutgers quarterback room is in a better spot today than it was a year ago at the start of training camp? Yeah, I think I think it is. Uh, we saw there was a lot of hope that Gavin would be would take his game to the next level. Right. But it was ultimately when you look back at it, very similar to his previous year. But the one thing he did really well, obviously, besides the rushing, which was fantastic, he limited turnovers. And that was so uh, underappreciated last year. I, I thought he made huge strides to protect the football and almost sometimes limited himself from from pressing uh, and and. and going for, for big plays and things like that because he wanted to protect the ball because he knew how important, you know, ball control and, and playing defense was. And that's the Rutgers formula for winning. So I, I don't know. I, I think it is better, not significantly better, uh, but a little bit, a little bit. I, I would agree. I think on paper it is better. And to I agree with Greg, it better be, because if it's not, then they're not going to have the season they hope for. Uh, I think what, Rutgers may lose in the running game because you're right. Gavin Wimsett, for to his credit, was a good rusher and popped off for some big key runs against Virginia Tech and Indiana. It'll be better in the passing game because I do think Kalik Manis will be better at completing those simple throws that just takes the offense to the next level and helps them move the ball more efficiently. Turnovers, I, I agree with you. Gavin limited them. He had some killer ones, though, in some really killer spots against Ohio State, against Wisconsin. I think one against Iowa, uh, Michigan. I don't know if Kelly Manis will be better at that or reduce those. I think that's going to be uh, an important part too. Uh, but I, again, I just think the fact that Kelly Manis probably is expected to at least complete the simple throws uh, that just killed Rutgers so often the last two years automatically makes the room better. We talked a lot about the offense and expectations. There are a lot of the position battles obviously are on that side of the ball. What's something the fans should know about the defense heading into training camp? We talked about the returning experience. Nine of 11 starters are back, probably 20 guys played last season, so a ton of snaps. But outside of that experience, what's something that you've kind of zeroed in on? Yeah, I think Greg Shaw has mentioned this a couple times this offseason that the big emphasis now is getting a pass rush with four guys on the defensive line and not needing extra help. And I, I agree, uh, Rutgers has not been able to get a ton of sacks in the last couple of years. Last year was a bit of a disappointing year for Aaron Lewis and Wesley Bailey on the stats front, in the numbers front. And I think Greg Schiano alluded to Wesley Bailey being banged up a bit most of the year and kind of limiting him. And I think if he is able to play at the level that he was projected to, if Aaron Lewis is able to take that step that it always felt he was ready to take but has not yet, if those guys can get home more often and create more pressure on opposing quarterbacks and Rutgers can become more of a sack team, I think that'll be a huge step forward because that will even help the back end force some turnovers, get some interceptions, and play at a higher level. Uh, so that, to me, I think is the biggest thing that I'm looking at, and I think that is the one area I'm looking at that can take this defense from great. I think the, the defense was great last year. I think that can make them elite. And I think the other thing is is the depth is so much better, right? All these guys are back, but there's also guys waiting in the wing that are going to contribute at a big level. You know, linebacker Moses Walker, Abram Wright, even a guy like Al Shadi Salam, a cornerback, converted running back, is going to get a lot of snaps, maybe play some nickel. There's a lot of guys, uh, even young guys, that you're you're going to learn these names, and they'll they'll be kind of surprises and under the radar. But I think that was a key to the Rutgers defense. The one we talked about how great they played, a, a great great year, but you know down the stretch they did wither a little bit. I think I think back to that Iowa game right? One of the worst offenses in the country. And they kind of, they, Iowa lit up Rutgers. And I think that was just a combination of lack of depth, uh, end of the season and a whole bunch of things. But I think that will be better. And I know Shiano is really 
aggressively targeting that late season swoon that happened last year uh, uh, and trying to fix that. I, I know that's a, a priority for them. Quickly over special teams. Obviously, Jay Patel is back, the most accurate season for a kicker in Rutgers history, so that's a good spot. Uh, changes at long snapper, which was a sneaky uh, weak spot for them last year. I think they're hoping that Austin Riggs uh, will kind of solve that issue. And then punter, they have another Australian punter. I don't know about you, Pat. I feel very confident that anyone with an Australian accent can punt the ball pretty well for Rutgers, so I think they're in a pretty good spot there. I, I agree. The the one special teams thing, and I even wrote about it in our training camp battles is what what has become of the return game right christian dremel inherited that role later in the season after rashad rochelle just wasn't working for Rutgers. he did a great job sure-handed but Rutgers wasn't getting anything in its return game I'm, I'm curious to see how greg addresses that early on in camp who's back there is he looking for that game-changing speed or is dremel just going to be the guy because he can be relied on so We'll see. We'll see. I, I'm very curious to see who, who's out there. So I uh, will keep an eye on the return game for sure as well. I think they were pretty nervous about some of the drops in punts and kickoffs last year, and they obviously preferred stability over any real game-changing uh, action. I also am curious with that, uh, knowing the way this program kind of operates, I would guess they're more concerned with security in receiving the ball. And if they're going to take any risks, it's in kind of finding the next Max Melton to block punts and, and create that game-changing play like they had at Miami like they had uh, against Michigan State. Um, but who knows? They can surprise us. Uh, I think that is a great point, a sneaky, interesting aspect um, in training camp. Experience the Heldridge Hotel, a luxury hotel that's perfect for both the business and leisure traveler. Ideally located within minutes of Rutgers University, the Heldridge is convenient to all the action and activities at SHI Stadium, Jersey Mike's Arena, and the Rutgers University campus. The moment you walk through the doors of the Heldridge Hotel and Conference Center, you know you're someplace different. A place with an independent spirit and a boutique vibe. A place where you can immerse yourself in your meeting or event as easily as you can the local culture. Located in the heart of the city, the Heldridge lets you experience all that New Brunswick has to offer. Whether you're coming to New Brunswick for a fun weekend with friends, in town for a Scarlet Knights game, or attending a business meeting, book your accommodations today at theheldridge.com. Pat, are you ready? To move on to a segment we did last year, a fun segment, true and false. Do we have a choice? No, absolutely no choice. All right, let's start off with an, a fun, interesting, and probably easy one. Kyle Manungai rushed for 1,000 yards last year, obviously, was the first one to do so in 11 years. If he does so again this year, he would be the first Rutgers running back to go back-to-back -back seasons with 1,000 yards since Ray Rice did it three times. True or false, Kyle Manungai will run for at least a thousand yards for a second straight season. True. I think that's not an easy benchmark, but coming off last season with the way he ran, I think that that would be, it would be really, really bad for Rutgers if he didn't get to a thousand yards. I'll say true too. The only hesitancy I'd have is if Sam Brown emerges back to his form and they go four by a committee. But I think Kyle Manungai has proven to be the workhorse and has proven to be the guy in the fourth quarter. You want the ball in his hands. So I I, I agree, true. I, I'd be surprised if, if he wasn't another thousand yard rusher. All right. A Rutgers receiver will collect at least a thousand yards for the first time since Leontay Carew did it in 2014. And this is extra significant. The Rutgers hasn't even had someone break 600 yards, I think. Bo Melton was right around that, what, five years ago. So the benchmark is a thousand. Can Rutgers get someone there? I'll say true. And that's just because I put a lot of faith in Dimir Miller to wow. be that true wide receiver one to transition his success from FCS to FBS. Um, I'm putting a lot of stock in him. I'm kind of riding the momentum that Greg Schiano gave him at the podium, had a lot of good things to say. Uh, so I'll say true. Dimir Miller will break the drought. Well, I'm surprised by that. I'm surprised by that. I think a thousand yards is a lot for a receiver. Miller had what thirteen hundred last season at Monmouth, so that would that would be quite the accomplishment to almost replicate that. I'm going to say false on that one, but I I do think there will be much better receiving play. I just think it's going to be spread around because there are just so many guys that are capable. Fair enough. Um, and this is kind of goes hand in hand with the last one. Rutgers has not had a two thousand yard passer since Chris Laviano did it in 2015. For context, Gavin Wimsett had 1,735 last year. In a year that he struggled, and we've talked about ad nauseum, 
how much he struggled in the past game. So with that being said, will Aethi Calic Manis will become the first Rutgers quarterback to throw for at least 2,000 yards in a season? Yeah, I think that's really realistic and and a good benchmark. We're, we're talking about him being improved over Wimsett. I think 2,000 yards is realistic. I'm going to go true. Better wide receiving core, ideally a better offensive line, and yes, ideally a better quarterback. I would be surprised if they didn't surpass this mark. I'll say true. Yeah, doesn't have to face those Michigan cornerbacks either. Uh, schedule is a little bit easier. I, I think I think that should be a definite true. I hope we revisit these at the midway point, by the way. We can revisit them before the season, after watching training camp, and we can revisit them halfway through the season. All right. And then at the end of the season, there's no limit to how many times we can revisit this. Lock it in, because we're the king of freezing cold takes, so this is perfect. And we'll get Politi's opinion on these at the end of training camp, after having seen zero minutes of training camp. So that'll be a fun refresher as well. Perfect. And then he'll quiz us, like, if how much Olympic coverage we watched uh, and all that, too. So perfect. perfect. All right. Next up, Rutgers will be ranked in the AP top 25 for the first time since 2012. This is tough. It is because I think it's very realistic. Um, I think if the Jake Butt prophecy happens and they do start off 7-0, and it would be really hard not to rank them. Uh, I just don't know. The season is so full of 50-50 games, and it will depend on how much of a run Rutgers could go on and winning these games consecutively. Uh, I think they'll need a hot start. So I'll say true. I think it's their best chance of doing so, but I'm not entirely confident on that. I can kind of see it go either way. I'm going to say true. Here's why. Rutgers got one vote last year. Steve Johnson, TCU beat, beat reporter. When they got to six and two, I believe. Correct. Once they became bowl eligible. Virginia Tech is a hype machine in, in the media world. People love Virginia Tech. I wouldn't be surprised if Virginia Tech sneaks into the back end of the top 25 uh, ahead of that game against Rutgers. And, and Rutgers could go down to Blacksburg, very well win that game. There you have a ranked win. That could be the impetus, a 3-0 and start. Um, but that's, that's I don't know. We'll see. One one possibility. But like you said, 7-0 is possible. 3-0 is possible. I, I just wanted to point out the Virginia Tech hype because it's somewhat based in reality. Yes. Uh, Greg McElroy, who's an ESPN commentator, called that matchup a sneaky good matchup from the ACC during his coverage of the league this year, so this uh, week. So I think people are starting to catch some buzz from both Rutgers and Virginia Tech. And this is a good transition to the next question, which is Rutgers will defeat a ranked opponent for the first time since 2009. Rutgers has the longest drought of defeating ranked opponents among Power 5 programs, and I'm fairly certain they also have the longest drought of being ranked among Power 5 opponents, so Rutgers could kind of get the monkey off their back this year with that. Pat, will Rutgers defeat a ranked team this season? If it's not, if Virginia Tech doesn't get in the AP poll by then, I'm thinking they're not going to be ranked when Rutgers plays them. Then the only other team that I think has a shot at being in the top 25 on the schedule is USC. I think that's a crazy tough game for Rutgers. Is it possible... Nebraska or Wisconsin, maybe uh, from a ranking perspective, not talking wins or losses. Uh, I just think there aren't going to be a lot, whole lot of opportunities here. If it's not Virginia Tech, it's got to be USC, um, which is crazy to think after the schedule Rutgers has played the last couple of years that that they might not even face two ranked teams this entire year is almost unfathomable. So you're going false? I'm going false. I agree exactly for the reasons you laid out. You made the perfect case. I think Rutgers would be good enough to beat one of the, you know, 15 to 25 teams if they ran into them during the season. But to your point, I'm not sure they will. I think it'll be more about lack of opportunities than it'll be talent. So I'm I'm going to go false with you as well. Yeah, that's a, it's going to be an interesting one. How's your AP ballot coming, by the way? Uh, I submitted it uh, this week, so I wouldn't forget. Uh, and it's about as chalk as you possibly can get. The only thing I changed was there was a battle between Georgia and Ohio State for number one. Georgia was leaning more towards number one from a lot of the projections I saw. I picked Ohio State. I think they're probably the most talented team, most complete team, and their fan base might commit an insurrection on Ohio Stadium if they don't win a national championship this year. So I think the pressure from the outside uh, will kind of motivate them as well. So I am I think Ohio State will be the top team in the country, and I think they're the favorite to win the national title. But other than that, really – 
chalk. And before anyone asks, no, I did not vote for Rutgers in the AP Top 25 quite yet. But I do think, as we talked about before, there is a chance they can make it at some point. So we'll see. All right. I know Jake Butt would say Rutgers will host college game day. He'll he'll say anything about Rutgers at this point. That guy is bleeding scarlet. Question is, Rutgers will be part of a marquee college game day, the the host college game day for the first time ever. True or false? Right. They've never hosted college game day and they've never been the opponent in a college game day game. So they've never been part of the, you know, the big, you know, pomp and circumstance of of the, the show. Uh, I, and this is kind of similar to what you said about the last one. I don't know if they'll have opportunities against teams that would earn that distinction, right? The only way I could see this happening is if, again, the Jake Butt prophecy happens, they start off 7-0, and 8-0, and 9-0, and they're a top 15 team, and they're the talk of college football, which, again, is, is it possible? I'd say so. I would say it's highly unlikely. So I'm going to go false here, and they're going to have to go another year or two or however many more until college game day uh, shows up in Piscataway. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to go false as well. Right. It feels uh, th- that feels like the upper end. If, if college game day is at Rutgers, then, you know, that it's an absolute um, Monster madhouse. Year. Monster uh, year. I was interested to learn this, too, because I thought of Louisville. Right. That was a huge game. But that was a Thursday night. I was right. college game day doesn't do right. Thursday night games. And I think even the Louisville 2012 game for the Big East was also a Thursday night game. Right? Thursday. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Right. And interesting. Like maybe the best Rutgers home game this year is going to be that Washington game week four or yeah week four that's a Friday night too so I I don't know it would have to be stars would really have to align for that right and and you to that point even USC is a Friday night maybe Wisconsin is really the only Nebraska but Nebraska doesn't play anybody before before playing Rutgers Rutgers doesn't really play anybody either so the stars are aligning in a lot of different things this year for Rutgers college game day is just not one of them now this I thought this was Fun, right? Half of Rutgers' schedule is teams that they have never beaten. They have never beaten Minnesota, Nebraska, Washington, USC, UCLA, and Wisconsin. They never played UCLA or USC, so kind of a bit of a trick part of it, but those are six teams. Uh, I guess my question is true or false. Rutgers will beat at least three of them this year. Wow. Sidebar, Greg Schiano pointed out to us that Wisconsin has not had a losing season in 21 years. I actually went back and looked. It's actually 23 years. Who's, who's checking? Who's checking? fact-checking Shiano these days? I don't know. But, yeah, just, just to his broader point was that the easier teams on the schedule, like Wisconsin, it's crazy. It's crazy to think about, right? They're still a more key program, great coach, great program. So, But of that list... Uh yeah, I I can spot three wins. You want me, you want me to you want me go for it? All right, Minnesota dub, Washington at home blackout game. I think so much momentum riding in that game. I I think it's going to be a circus in New Brunswick or Piscataway. Dub, UCLA. I think just they're not there yet. So many so much upheaval there. I think that's a win. And I think Nebraska and Wisconsin, USC are are really tough games. Um, so I, I think that's three is the perfect number there, I think. So you're going true. I'm going true. I'm really, really torn because I think three is, is the exact right number because I can get two. I'm with you completely on Minnesota and UCLA. I think those are Rutgers, games Rutgers is probably going to be favored in and I can see them winning their home games. Uh, Minnesota is going to have insane buzz between Cali Manis playing his former team, you know, uh, Corey Heatherman's on the other team, Kirk Sharaka, all these, the intermixing of these two teams. Uh, I think that'll be a lot of excitement in UCLA is, uh, I don't know if you saw their coach opening oh. statement at big 10 media day. Uh, that means probably nothing oh, as far oh. as the team, but brutal, right? The, the beauty of that is that people don't even realize is that the guy behind the scenes is Eric B I mean, come on, like, Deshaun Foster, he's a great coach, great recruiter, not a rah-rah guy. It was a really, really bad look for him at, on media day. But at the end of the day, like, they still have Eric Bieniemy calling the plays, <laughs> you know. So I think uh, I'm not going to write UCLA off because of a bad press conference, but I, I think they still just have a lot of issues. Not, not issues, but from a talent perspective, I, I think Rutgers is just a better team. Right. 
Now, the issue is with me is I can't find the third win that I feel confident in. I am leaning Nebraska. I think, yes, playing on the road at Nebraska will be very tough, insane environment, great coaching staff, some talent on that team. But their quarterback, great as he is as a five-star quarterback, is still going to be a true freshman. And I think Greg Schiano is going to kind of be rubbing his hands, ready for the opportunity to kind of frazzle uh, a guy like that and uh, create havoc. So I don't know if they beat Nebraska. I think they have a chance there. They have a chance against Washington. I'm not sold on them. Uh, but I just I'm, – I'm not – um, at the point where I can pinpoint the third team. But I think if they get four cracks at it, at those other four teams, they're bound to win one, right? So I'll go true. Uh, I just can't name the teams. I'm not as confident as you are uh, there. All right. Talked about the games. Where are we going to go? The big wins, the the potential wins. Let's put it on the line. Rutgers will finish with a first winning record in Big Ten play. Rutgers has never finished above 500 in the Big Ten before. Is this the season? Rutgers has never even gotten to 500 in the Big Ten. Their their best mark was three wins. Uh, so to do the, to for this to be true, they'd have to win at least five. Um, and I think we could find five wins on that schedule between Michigan State, Illinois, Maryland, Minnesota, UCLA, and then the other four. You know, kind of a uh, crapshoot. I'm sure they could find a win or two there. So I'll say true. I think it'll be kind of a disappointment if they don't right because they need to win at least five games to get to eight and four, which seems like the bare minimum for, you know, a, a step forward, a good season. So I'll say true. I'm going to go true as well. So I think that uh, I'll keep it short and simple on that one. I, the way we've talked about these expectations this year, the experience back, I, I think the schedule, how that shook out is, is just uh, unimaginable after playing in the big 10 East for uh, 10 years. <laughs> I loved what, uh, the Big Ten Network asked Shiano, are you going to be okay not playing in the Big Ten East? And I thought his answer was really good, too, saying, I strive for that competition, of course. But uh, I think deep down, he he's, uh, you know, we'll never admit it, but it's a, it's a great thing. It's a great thing for Rutgers not to have to play those top dogs this year. If he had the chance to play, swap in Ohio State and Michigan into this year's schedule, I don't think he'd sign on the dotted line. So I think he's, I think he's pretty happy. Um, no matter how he tries to spin it, that uh, he's not playing those essentially automatic losses. All right, and now we'll go to your questions uh, submitted through nj.com slash text, our texting subscriber service. Thank you all for uh, sending questions and anyone that wants to sign up, again, nj.com slash text. Follow us all year round. We'll be texting with you guys. We'll answer your questions and you get a chance to ask us what you want for the podcast. Um, I guess the one thing we didn't touch on, we touched on this a little bit in our last episode, but people are... Uh, asking a little bit differently, uh, Tyreen Powell, will he play before the Virginia Tech game? What do you think? I was surprised to hear how much he's doing already. I think I, if I was Rutgers, I wouldn't play him until Virginia Tech, but I think he's going to be good to go. My gut says he's going to be good to go against Howard. I think he will be too. I think if they use him, it'll be kind of in the limited feel his way out. I'm sure in an ideal world, Rutgers is up 30 points against Howard. They can kind of sneak him in just to get some game reps. Uh, and I wouldn't be surprised if he doesn't get some action against Akron because you don't want him to play his first game action of the year in Blacksburg at Lane Stadium in front of a crazy atmosphere and one of the most consequential, if not the most consequential game of the year. Uh, so I agree. I think he'll play. I think he'll play before Virginia Tech. And how about the story for Tyreen Powell in itself, right? A guy coming out of high school, committed to Virginia Tech, talked about it in media days like i haven't been to virginia tech since then but obviously place was a he marveled at it i think it'll be there'll be a lot on it on his mind obviously for that game so something else to keep in mind i've never been myself i don't know if you've been to Lane stadium but no, i'm looking forward no, to uh yeah. looking forward to understanding I, I have seen metallica in concert that's a great show but i'm i'm intrigued to see enter sandman awesome um another one we we Talked about the situation on our last pod, but I don't know if we gave a definitive answer. Who is the backup quarterback? Greg Schiano said there'd be a battle. Who do you think ends up winning the battle? And if, you know, heaven forbid, Ethan Calic Manis gets hurt in game one, who is going to be the guy taking the field? I really think that AJ Cerise is headed for the redshirt year anyway. He could still redshirt and be the backup if he doesn't play in more than four games. But I think at this point, Greg said, like, like he said, a Johnny finished spring ball as the backup. They're going to start that way. Heading into camp, I, I, I'm 
I'm leading in Johnny Shepard here, just based on his year in the program. Physically looks a little stronger, bigger, but I, of course, think AJ Serace is going to be have a big role in this team in the future. There's no question. I agree. I just think it's asking a lot for a true freshman who still needs some physical development to, you know, be thrown into the wolves. Um, especially when again you have a guy, a Johnny, been around the program, ideally has picked some things up, learned from the from Gavin Wimsett and the other guys last year, and comes in in place. So I, I I agree. This next one, at quarterback, what is a realistic completion percentage? to hope for, for Ethan Cali McManus is 58% realistically possible. Uh, for context, Gavin was set through 47%, which was again, the lowest in FBS football. Cali McManus last year at Minnesota completed 53.1%. So is 58% uh, realistic? What, what would you say? And if not, what number are you looking at? I think if, if Rutgers doesn't get to 58%, I, I think realistically the threshold has to be 60% for this offense to be efficient and and high powered. So I think if you get to 60%, it's great. And and that should be the benchmark for a successful season. I would agree, especially if Rutgers is going to run a, again, a conservative offense where a lot of the throws they ask to make are the simple ones. And you're not really asked to make the tough tight window throws or deep throws. Uh, I, I would agree. It, 55 should be to me, the absolute bare minimum. And I think 58% would be good. Ideally 60 or above would be um, would be right where you'd want it at. So um, that that would be maybe the most tracked statistic on the team this year. And uh, I think it was a great question. Uh, tight end, we kind of touched on it a little bit. Do we have a clear starter? I think Kenny Fletcher is probably the favorite, but I don't know if he is at this point the clear starter yet. Yeah, I'm also curious to see how many time like form- formation wise, will Rutgers play two tight ends? Uh, I think absolutely. I, so I, I think it'd be stupid to kind of think of it as like, okay, Kenny Fletcher's the starter and that's it. Like all these guys are going to be in the game. I think Higgins, Kanopka and Fletcher, then Logan Blake is a year in the program. And then there's two incoming freshmen in the tight end room. So I think those three guys that are juniors, at least juniors, Higgins, Fletcher and Kanopka, who's a senior, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll all play this year. Sure. Uh, Greg talked about NFL guys. He mentioned Tyron Powell was six, you know, six games away from being a day one pick. Uh, Great quote, by the way. I I agree. Um, it clearly shows how much value they put into him. Uh, who else do you think is kind of an NFL guy on this year's roster that uh, can get drafted, or at the very least, get kind of a UDFA deal, where in Christian Izzy style, where they have a chance of contributing? It's almost like crazy to think about. Did you see the Shrine Bowl list? Shrine Bowl a thousand is always a really good projection of what. NFL scouts and guys um, at the next level are looking at in college players. I think Rutgers had eight guys make that list, eight or nine, which was the most ever for Rutgers. So it's a really, really deep group um, that that a, a lot. Of, I, I'm not, I wouldn't be surprised if the number is eight or nine next year. Honestly, um, I think the 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 surefire guys that have a really good chance of getting drafted are Manungai. Tyreen Powell and Holland Pierce, you know, has a good shot as well. So I think those three guys would, would probably be at, at the top of the list, but you go down to flip Dixon, very enticing professional safety. Um, Desmond Igmanosin, I think has the body for the NFL. Shaquan loyal has been great. I, I mean, Robert, Lo- I mean, Rob, Lo- Robert longer beam. So, or Dimir Miller, I, I think, yeah, what was that nine or ten right there? So it's it's a fascinating topic. I I, I really think uh, down the line we'll we'll probably reach out to some scouts and and do this do this story at some point because it's fascinating. Yep, yep. And I think we can agree though. Tyree Powell is probably the best NFL prospect they have on the roster at this point. Yeah, if not Manungai, I thought might have been like a fourth or fifth rounder last year. So if he has another great year, he might be into that third or fourth round. I think too. So. No doubt, but, no yeah, doubt. Owls, definitely a huge upside. Uh, and last one, uh, this is the second time we've been asked this, but people are very curious about how we voted in the unofficial Cleveland.com poll and where we ranked Rutgers and our justifications. We have to justify uh, why we picked Rutgers where we did. Do you, I don't know if you have your, your list in front of you, if you remember, but just kind of yeah. give us a rundown. Yeah. yeah, I do. I had Rutgers uh, eighth, so not that not that different from from what came out uh, in the end where Rutgers was picked ninth. I had, I had Wisconsin still ahead of Rutgers and USC. 
So actually, I, I'm going to add Rutgers seventh. Um, the same five, USC. Those same five, U- sorry, sorry. I'll try to do this in my head. Top five, USC, Wisconsin, Rutgers seven. Yeah, I had Rutgers seventh. I had Rutgers ninth, and I think they are – obviously, there's the top five that – pretty much has been undisputed between Ohio State, Oregon, Michigan, Penn State, and Iowa was the fifth one. I guess their defense is going to be elite again, and they got to hope the quarterback is better. And six is USC. I agreed with that. And then the two I had ahead of Rutgers uh, was Wisconsin. I think Luke Fickle is going to take that program to the next level. And Nebraska. I think Matt Rule is a proven college coach that always his teams take a leap in year two, and uh, they have a really, really talented quarterback and some good pieces around him. Um, so then that's where I have them. And then I have Rutgers at nine, which I thought was probably a fair position. And I think, I think if you're a Rutgers fan, you got to sign up for that, right? If, if you asked where do you put them, you put them at ninth. I think that's the best they've ever been in the big 10 for sure. Yeah. I thought the really interesting one, Washington goes to the national championship last year. Obviously everything's changed, but they still have a really good quarterback, a, a really good head coach. I don't want to say like, that would that walk like Washington's gonna be great. I, I don't think Washington um it's gonna be it's gonna be just such a great game at Rutgers, but I think the crowd, the environment ultimately puts Rutgers over the top. But I thought Washington got such little respect this year. And, and it, it came from myself included. So I'm not, <laughs> in hindsight, I, I'm I'm kind of like back and forth on Washington. That's all the questions we got. Thanks again, guys, for submitting your questions and uh we look forward to doing a lot of that more as the season goes on. All right, what else? Bring your sunscreen to practice today. Anything else? Yeah, a couple big picture stuff. Uh, Friday, uh, the NCAA is settled in court, uh, the House settlement, essentially uh, moving forward on schools being able to pay athletes. And I think there's still a lot of details to be ironed out. We asked Greg Schiano about this at Media Day, and he – played a little bit coy i think he has a little bit more insight to how it's going to look and how the team is preparing than he let on but i think they have a lot of things to figure out as far as how much money they expect to give to football players uh we had guys at sec media days talking 12 to 15 million for their football teams i'm not quite sure if Rutgers and other big 10 teams will go to the same level but i would think that they will have the means to do so with the new big 10 media rights deal uh, but that is the kind of next big picture step here that's going to happen next season. And it's going to be interesting to see how each team, and especially Rutgers, uh, pulls its resources, what money goes to where, and how that impacts recruiting. But one thing that tells me that Rutgers was prepared for this is the fact they do have this enormous recruiting class uh, that they they know they can kind of use the money from the house settlement to entice players, obviously. And then the other thing I think you can talk about is the, the roster – limits changes i think that is also a big reason why they have the big recruiting class because they know that roster sizes are going to expand um how do you think that'll impact Rutgers? yeah tony petiti the commissioner of the big 10 admitted uh in his press conference that the big 10 was pushing for more scholarships for football more more so than than other conferences and the big 10 is a big reason why the number is going to land uh i think an additional up to one 20 now and it was a it was at 85 I, we'll see and then when the numbers come out officially but i think the push was for 120 obviously right now it's 85 so that's a significant change obviously more players will be on scholarship they'll be partaking in the revenue sharing but it, it also raises an interesting question about what what does Rutgers what do schools do with walk-on opportunities um you're capped at 120 or you can go up to 120 scholarships um which is a great opportunity um, but there's, there's roster flexibility there and, and how everything shakes out is going to be, is going to be fascinating. Like what, it, what it means for guys that have really blossomed at Rutgers have fascinating stories. There are three of them on this team this year. Uh, when you think about Holland Pierce came on as a walk-on one year of football experience, cut down, changed his body, terrific story to become the player he is today. Christian Dremel was a walk-on out of Don Bosco. Not a lot of opportunities. Um, obviously, led the team in receiving last year, so that's an incredible story. And, of course, Timmy Ward overcame cancer, ACL tear. He was given an opportunity as a, a, a equipment manager before trying out for the team and making it. So it would be a shame college football, that these walk, this walk-on tradition goes away, but maybe it just gets absolved 
with a with a scholarship. I don't know. Maybe it'll all work out in the end. And uh, we're kind of just monkeying around here, but something to think about. To, to your point, the number that was floated around earlier this week by Ross Dellinger was 105, which is still That's 20 right. more than they currently have. Um, and I think the walk-on situation would essentially be a trickle-down effect where a guy like Christian Dremel, if he couldn't walk on at Rutgers, would maybe commit to a you know, a Bryant or a Stony Brook or that level and then eventually develop and become one of the FCS stars that does make the next level, uh, next step as a transfer portal kind of gem. I think that's kind of the new pathway here, but I don't know how long that'll last because who knows what the next change coming uh, to college football uh, will be. All right, guys, that'll do it for us today. Uh, looking forward to the first day of training camp and we'll keep you guys updated on all the happenings, all the news, all the updates we can over on nj.com slash Rutgers and we'll talk to you soon. We'll see you at camp, guys. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to the Rutgers Rant. To participate in the conversation and receive live updates about the Scarlet Knights directly to your phone, sign up at nj.com slash insider.